I had, I had built a, a toboggan. And I think everybody in this audience at one time or another stupidly rode a toboggan, which is, <laughs> it's aimed right at a hospital bed. <laughs> Too, but I thought I'd wipe out. <laughs> and my kids and my kids thought it was a little too dorky too. <laughs> this is a little better. So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Skiers, snowboarders too. Um, <laughs> welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks a lot for joining us. Appropriately enough, on the opening weekend of ski season. Um, yeah. Who got out there? Yeah. That's it. Yeah? Eight, 18 inches of snow at Crystal, I heard? Yeah. That's pretty appropriate, I think. 38 inches. Serious. Are you exaggerating a little? Come on. Um, no, seriously, thank you all for coming out. We really, really appreciate it uh, uh, for helping us with this uh, celebration of this oversized life and career of Warren Miller. A man who turned his passion for freedom, for world travel, for friendship, for adventure, and for fun into a brand and a, and a lifestyle and a, and a body of work that has inspired generations of skiers and filmmakers alike. He's sort of like Martin Scorsese with, uh, combined with Jean-Claude Keeley with a little bit of Peter Pan thrown in. <laughs> um, my name's Neil Thompson. I'm a writer and a skier here in Seattle. And uh, I got to know Warren a little bit earlier this year while working on a story about him for Seattle Net Magazine. So as a journalist and author uh, over the years, I've aspired to tell stories about people who live really big lives and to kind of get behind how and why they, they live those lives and what, what drives them. And uh, I learned that Warren lived um, near here in Seattle and I, I sought him out and asked him if he would spend some time with me and allow me to tell his story. I Googled a bunch about him and found out that the story about his full life hadn't seemed to really have ever been fully told. Um, so, so I spent some time with, uh, with Warren and his, and his lovely wife, Lori, and, and learned about his not so easy childhood in, in Southern California. Um, I learned about his stint in the US Navy and, and uh, almost drowning when his ship got sunk in a hurricane. Um, and I, and I learned how after, um, after getting out of the Navy in the late 1940s and through the 1950s, he, he just created himself, turned himself into a filmmaker through just sheer force of will and, and determination. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting with, or at least speaking with over the phone, a bunch of Warren's friends uh, who had known him over the years. And uh, I talked to a guy named Dave McCoy, who was the founder of Mammoth Mountain Ski Area, who told me, Warren would go skiing for a day and make a dozen friends. Um, another guy I talked to, Ward Baker, who Warren and I will talk about in a little bit, this guy who Warren spent the winter of 1946 uh, living in the parking lot at Sun Valley, Idaho, inside of a little teardrop trailer, freezing their tails off. He told me uh, how Warren broke the trail. He went places and took pictures of places nobody had ever seen which is really true. I mean, he sort of created this genre that, that, uh, that is now known more for extreme sports and, and sort of the aggressive style of skiing. But this genre that, that, that Warren created was really more about family and friendship. Um, he's directed hundreds of films over the years. Um, they've been shot all over the, all over the world. Um, and they've inspired many skiers, including folks from New Jersey, like myself. Um, so I started skiing when I was just a little toddler. My, my aunt and uncle bought me a, a pair of secondhand skis and I learned in the backyard and then started going uh, uh, Friday afternoons with the school with ski bus. Um, I, uh, I went skiing with my dad. I raced a little bit in high school. And I guess the, the sport always represented to me more than the other sports that I had that I tried, more so than baseball and football. There was something fulfilling about skiing. 
It, it, it was challenging yourself. It was about getting outside. It was about being part of a group, but being an individual at the same time. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you here tonight are skiers, right? So you know what I'm talking about, and you snowboarders might know a little bit of what I'm talking about too. But what I, what I love about uh, skiing and what many skiers love about the culture and lifestyle of, of the sport, especially the brand of skiing that, that Warren has championed over the decades, is that you don't have to be extreme or an expert or, or, or risking your neck, really. Uh, it can be anything you want it to be. Um, and, it can, and you can do it, as Warren has proved, well into your 80s. It's about family and friends. It's about being in touch with the outdoors. It's about being happy, having fun, and being free, which is something Warren talks about a lot. Um, and I think that's what Warren's life and his films represent. It's what they're all about. And I like it that Warren never just aimed his camera at the people he depicted in his films. Um, he lived that life that he portrays in those films. And in doing so, he's inspired us. And for that, we're grateful. So let's give him a, a round of applause. <laughs> So in just a few moments, Warren's going to come out, and here and I are going to uh, sit at those comfy chairs and, and chat a little bit about his, his career. Um, but first, I want to bring out Carl Spence, Artistic Director for the Seattle International Film Festival, and Deborah Person, SIF's Managing Director, and they're going to present Warren with his well-deserved Golden Space Noodle Award for Lifetime Achievement. Good evening. Uh, it, are, it is our pleasure to be here tonight and to present Warren Miller with SIF's Lifetime Achievement Award, created by Dale Chihuly. <laughs> SIF has a long tradition of honoring and celebrating extraordinary filmmakers from around the world. And yet, it is a rare treat to be able to honor one living here in our own backyard and one who has devoted his career to celebrating an essential part of the quality of life here in the Northwest. Warren's career embodies so much of what SIF is all about, creating experiences that bring people together to discover extraordinary films from around the world, and through the art of cinema, fostering a community that is more informed, aware, and alive. His credits include over 750 sports films. In addition to ski movies, he's directed films about sailing, surfing, and off-road racing. Self-taught, fueled by passion for sports and the outdoors, he single-handedly created what has become a very popular genre, inspiring generations of extreme sports filmmakers. In addition to giving talented skiers a chance to show their skill, Miller's goal was to expose people to the greater world of skiing. And by obsessively and playfully documenting that world, and by making it all look so fun, he not only entertained and inspired thousands of us every year, he helped the sport itself grow. Tonight, we celebrate not only the hours of entertainment he has given us, but the inspiration he has given filmmakers and filmgoers alike. Warren Miller is truly one of the world's legendary filmmaking talents. Please join us in welcoming the extraordinary Warren Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, if you do that too long, it'll be a very long evening and you'll fall asleep when you watch the movie. <laughs> the, uh, the Space Needle is a, a very special, has a very special place in my heart. And there's a gentleman in the audience this evening whose father was the guy that built it, Howard Wright. Howard Wright Jr. is here. 
and he's carried on the tradition of good entertainment. And when anybody comes to Seattle, I say, go to the Space Needle and go to the restaurant that revolves, and in one hour, you can have an incredible view, a good meal, and spend a lot of money. <laughs> and, but you can get oriented to the Seattle area with that lunch. And this is indeed a, a very special honor for me. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say I'm speechless because then I'd be out of a job. <laughs> but it will be on a welcome place on my mantelpiece here on Orcas Island and also in Montana, where we're going in a couple of weeks to spend the winter, another winter skiing. And while I'm on the subject of skiing, I'll mention one thing. There's a lot of people are not here this evening because they got too tired skiing at Crystal today. Um, or Snoqualmie Pass, or Stevens Pass, or Mount Baker. And as you folks probably have heard, uh, Stevens Pass recently got sold, and the people that now own Stevens Pass are the same ones that own Crystal, Snoqualmie Pass, Alpenthal, and Stevens. And they will run it in a good way, and if any indication of them having a pipeline to whoever makes snow that's not out of a machine, they have it or you wouldn't have this season, which looks to be one of the best in history. Uh, they had 18 inches of powder snow today, uh, crystal blue skies, and reasonably long lines, which goes with early season. But now you've got all of, you've got two weeks in November, December, January, February, March, and last year they ran till July. And you can get a season pass for not a whole lot of money. If you go up there every day, you get your money's worth. But, but again, I, uh, I don't care whether you buy a season pass or a one day ticket, when you make your first run, you've gotten your money's worth for the year. Because when you get to the bottom of a hill, you're a completely different person than when you left the top. Is that not true? Yeah. Sure is. And I, I have been preaching about freedom most of my life, and that's what my films were around. And this trophy, I would not only call it a golden space needle, but a real indication of what I've been preaching, which is man's search for freedom. And so with this, I'll take it with me, and I'm gonna drill a hole in the bottom and put a cork in it, and I can fill it up and drink out of the top. <laughs> so th thank you very, very much. Now. Very nice. We're going we're to sit here and uh, we're gonna talk. he's going to ask me some questions and I'll tell a whole lot of lies and I hope that uh, <laughs> if you believe them, uh, good luck. <laughs> Whether they're true or not, it doesn't matter, right? It's all about a good story. Exactly right. And that's all I did for all of the years I made movies was tell stories and I had the film to back it up. <laughs> and to, I think to put it put my filmmaking career, if that's what I could call it, it was a lifetime labor of love. When I started, there was 15 chairlifts in the United States. There was one in Oregon. I think there was one over at Mount Spokane in 1940, 1950. And then you had to go to Sun Valley, Alto, Snow Basin. And there were two chairlifts in Colorado when I started, two chairlifts in Aspen. Today, not yet this year, but last year, in Vail, some days they had 25,000 people on the hill. That's how much it's, the whole thing has changed. And if you think about 25,000 skiers on the hill in business, you know, it's 75,000 toilet flushes every day that you have to, have to You have to have a whole crew to take care of that. And I've said for years that anything, any job you have here in the city, I don't care what it is, there is a ski resort that can use your skill. So if you get tired of the I-90 bridge or the 520 bridge or get tired of commuting, go to a ski resort and do the same thing. So why don't we start in the beginning and talk a little bit about the, the, the beginnings of your interest in, in both filmmaking and, and maybe more importantly, storytelling. Well, I think I was, I was really lucky because I, I was born midway between the end of World War I and the Depression, 1924. The bottom fell out in 1929, 
And when I was 10 years old, no, I was older than that. I was in the fourth grade, whatever that is. I was, a, I was working in a grocery store every Saturday and the guy gave me a dime at the end of the day and I was the only kid in my class with a job. But I bought a, a uni, it was called a Univex camera. It was made out of Bakelite, cost 35 cents. And I was in the Boy Scouts at the age of 12 and on my Boy Scout trips I took pictures of the other guys with their packs and making tent, putting the tents up and everything. And then I could share that with the kids who were playing football and basketball and baseball and stuff on the weekends. And they didn't know what I was doing. I knew what they were doing. They were in a court with a score and a, the whole thing. And I started, if you will, learning how to tell stories and showing them these little bitty still pictures in black and white. And that was probably the start of this whole thing that, if you will, messed up a lot of people's lives by, I know there's a lot of people out there, your parents hate you because you go skiing too much. <laughs> and they buy a lift ticket just to get rid of you for the weekend. <laughs> so, the th and, and that, that little black and white Univex was the start of this whole crazy film career. The day I got mustered out of the Navy in 1946, I spent my mustering out money for an eight millimeter camera. And when Ward Baker and I went on our infamous trip to Sun Valley, uh, we started taking, I had taken a lot of surfing films the summer before we went. And when we got to Sun Valley, we were taking movies of each other to learn how to ski. And we'd have Otto Lang's book and we'd see what we're doing and then we'd kind of change things around a little bit and do it worse. And <laughs> I, one evening I showed the surfing movies to some people who had never seen the ocean or a wave or a, a surfboard. And some of the, some, not some, but a lot of photography wasn't very good, so I had to cover it up with stories. And the following, <laughs> true or not, didn't matter because they'd never seen it. <laughs> and the following summer, I showed the, the Sun Valley ski movies to my friends at the beach who had never seen snow. And I did the same thing there. And after a while, I started getting invitations to dinner. And by the way, when you come to dinner, would you bring your projector and your screen and your pictures? And I don't know how many tuna casserole performances I did, <laughs> but there were a lot of them. And the people, and it was easy to say things then because nobody did a lot of this stuff. Today, everybody does it. And I thought everybody skied in those days. I thought everybody in the world skied because I didn't know anybody who did not ski or surf or both because I moved in those two genres. Uh, surfing in those days, completely different story. Uh, they hadn't invented fiberglass surfboards yet. Uh, so they were made out of balsa wood and redwood. Are you sneaking in? <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> they, hadn't, they hadn't invented wetsuits, they hadn't invented a lot of things that made the sport a whole lot more enjoyable, a whole lot easier. So we rode redwood surfboards because if you paddled on your knees, the balsa wood would cave in and then the water would get in and your board would fall apart and all that stuff. And then fiberglass came along. Hobie Alter, my next door neighbor on Orcas Island, invented foam, he and a guy named Grubby Clark. And then they start, because they, they were running out of balsa wood in the late 50s, early 60s. And now some of these surfboard manufacturers, you know, they're making a thousand surfboards a week in one factory. And so the chances of having a wave all to yourself are slim and none. I talked to a fellow the other day and he said, Warren, the only time I can really have a wave all to myself is sometime between 1.30 and 3 in the morning. And I've learned how, how to surf in the, in the total darkness and in a full moon. And there's nothing more enjoyable than riding a wave all by yourself. And while I'm on that subject, I'll mention one thing. I was really lucky because on December 7th, 1941, I was surfing at Malibu all by myself. Today, a good day at Malibu, there'll be 1,000, 1,500 surfboards on the beach. And the waves were maybe this high in December at Malibu because the swell comes from the north and goes to the, to the Palos Verdes instead of Malibu. And mid-afternoon I was tired. I crawled up in the, and fell asleep on the sand. I was awakened as the sun went down. 
And I went up and, and took a hot shower because we used to put a gallon jug of water on the hood of the car. Sun heats it up, end of the day, hot shower, get in the car and drive home comfortably. <laughs> and so as I went out on the Pacific Coast Highway, there were no cars going either direction. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I turned on my radio and finally got a signal. And then they were rebroadcasting Roosevelt's broadcast of this day, day in infamy. They had bombed Pearl Harbor while I was surfing at Malibu, all by myself. And somebody asked me the other day, what was the most memorable day of surfing? For me, that was it. How about your most memorable day of skiing? Actually, let me jump backwards before that. Do you remember the first time you saw someone on skis and what it meant to you? I had, I had built a, a toboggan. And I think everybody in this audience at one time or another stupidly rode a toboggan, which is, <laughs> it's aimed right at a hospital bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, up, I was up at a place called Big Pines out of Los Angeles, and we were trying to put a corner in a toboggan run. We'd shovel the snow up, and we were in our Levi's with our pajamas on under it, and we dipped our 39 cent cotton gloves in paraffin the night before, you know, all the stuff that you do when you're dumb. And <laughs> we were sopping wet, virtually from head to foot, freezing to death, and three skiers came down doing snowplow turns and stopped right by us. And I thought, wait a minute, I've been, we've been all day shoveling this one turn, and these guys know something that I don't. And I thought a lot about that, and as fate had it, within a week, I was at a friend of mine's house who was in my Boy Scout troop, and he had a pair of skis in his garage, and they were pine, and they had a mortised leather toe strap, and he had a pair of poles, and they were made by the Spalding Sporting Goods Company, no edges, no metal bindings, and he let me steal them from him for $2. Now, mind you, in those days, 25 cents an hour was an unheard of salary. It was too high, 10 cents an hour if you're lucky. So anyway, I got those skis, and my patrol leader lived on the other side of the tracks, if you will, and he had gone to Yosemite over Christmas and taken ski lessons, and he had skis with metal edges and bindings, and two weeks later, he and I and another Boy Scout went, we used to call it, we're going to the snow because not very many people realize this, but Seattle and Los Angeles are identical in their geographical layout, ocean to the west, mountains to the east, but in Los Angeles, the mountains go to, Mount Baldy is over 11,000 feet high. Mount Waterman is eight or nine. So anyway, we wound up at Mount Waterman, and I got in these skis trying to remember what I had read in Otto Lang's ski technique book. He had the book. And so I got in the skis, and I started traversing, and I tried to go into a snowplow turn, and my feet went out, and the skis went straight. <laughs> and so I leaned way back and dragged each heel in the snow, and I wound up out there in a pile of gravel, got out of the skis, turned them around, and traversed back. When I got back, I was 15 feet higher than when I left. <laughs> and I went back and forth maybe 3,000 times by lunchtime. And when we stopped for lunch, the guy's name was Johnny. I don't remember his last name. But I said, Johnny, if I give you my peanut butter sandwiches and two fig bars, can I try your skis? He said, sure. So I got into his, as they were called nowadays, bear trap bindings. And mind you, my boots were clear up to here. They had a little pocket on the side for a knife in case you got bit by a rattlesnake. You could cut a <laughs> hole in it and suck the poison out. How you ever got your mouth down there to do it, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> that's, something that, that's something the Boy Scouts never taught me. <laughs> There's a dirty joke here I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Has something to do with Pennsylvania, but anyway. Uh, the, going across that kind of corn snow slope, not very steep, with metal edges and coasting all the way across and out into the gravel. By the time I got, it was, you know, I coasted maybe from here to the back of the theater, and I probably went down the hill about six feet. Very slowly, I got there, and when I got back, 
I knew something had happened to my psyche. What it was, I don't know, but it was total freedom, but absolutely no control over it. <laughs> and that, that's the way I've led my life ever since. <laughs> uh, that's my wife clapping. <laughs> I, I was really lucky because I was born and lived through the depression and I found freedom very early because I came from a very dysfunctional family and let's just leave it at that. But I could roam the beach at Topanga Canyon in the late 20s, early 30s. And then we moved to San Fernando Valley and I roamed, roamed the, the Valley Mountains. And freedom has been what I was fortunate enough to experience virtually from day one that I can remember. And right now I'm writing my autobiography and that freedom theme keeps coming back as I write page after page after page of these, some stupid, some interesting, some whatever they are. And by the time I get through with the autobiography, I'll probably be 10,000 pages long, and I'll turn it over to an editor and it'll probably be about six pages, <laughs> or should be. But this is a long answer to, to Learning how to We're here understand. to hear you talk, not me. And, uh, you know, I've really been lucky in the ski thing because I think I was there when a lot of stuff was invented. Bob, for example, Bob Mickelson called me one day, and he and Jim Griffin had found 160 acres of private property on Snoqualmie Pass. And he said, we're going to build a ski resort called Alpental, and we need to raise some money. And could you come up and ride around in a helicopter for a couple of days and film Jim, myself, and one of the Whittaker boys? Whichever one will be there, you can use any name you want, because nobody can tell the difference. <laughs> but, you know, I've known them since they were 12 years old, and I still can't tell them apart. <laughs> anyway, we, we spent two days filming this nice corn snow, and I put a film together for the building of Alpenthal. And they showed that one day in Tacoma, they had 72 condominiums and vacant lots to sell. They showed it in Tacoma one day, Seattle the next day, completely sold out the 72 units and had a backup offer on every one of them based on showing this movie and me if you will, telling lies about how great this place was going to be. <laughs> and a lot of you have, you know, grew up there, and you can blame Bob Mickelson and Jim Griffin for that whole escapade. Anyway, uh, what was the question? I don't know. <laughs> Does it matter? No. <laughs> I'll wander away from whatever it was anyway. I'll get us back on some okay. kind of course. Let's go back to uh, and talk a little bit about Ward Baker and, and after you got out of the Navy and sort of the real beginnings of what became your filmmaking career, that, that, that winter of 1946 at Sun Valley. Let's talk about that. Well, Ward Baker, I surfed with Ward Baker when I was in high school. He lived in a beach in Manhattan and I used to go and park my car in front of his house and we'd ride, ride the waves in front of his house. And we went in the Navy together, joined V-12. It was a kind of a, a dodge the draft Navy training program, and I wound up getting three semesters at USC, which is a whole other story, which takes all day to tell, so I won't tell it because it's nighttime. And <laughs> he was able to get out of the Navy while we were going to USC because he had ridden a redwood surfboard longer than I had. And when you paddled on your knees, in those days you had great big surfing bumps. And the only other people in the world that had it were people who laid hardwood floors and they're on their knees all day and the doctors called it Osgood Slaughter's disease. So Ward got really tired of marching in the Navy and that sort of stuff, he wanted to go fishing. So he turned himself into sick bay and said, my right knee really hurts, see how swollen it is? And they looked at his other knee and they said, my God, you know, we've got to get him out of the Navy. So he got a medical discharge and, went, and then he went fishing. <laughs> and so when, when the war was over, I had my 8 millimeter camera and I wanted to go skiing in the worst way because the winter, the last winter I was in the Navy, I spent six weeks of that in Yosemite because somebody wisely put my orders in the bottom, 
drawer of her desk and her desk. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I was in Yosemite for six weeks and I really got hooked on the sport. So that the summer, the next summer, that summer, I paid $200 for a teardrop trailer that somebody had made. And I wanted, all I wanted to do was go skiing and I had enough money saved up from the Navy and Ward got, was a great mechanic. He could re repair any kind of car, anytime. It didn't matter what, it, you know, what was wrong with it. And so we got in that, tr in the car. I had a 1937 Buick that I'd gotten from my sisters when they got married and moved away. And he and I left Manhattan Beach probably a week or two before Thanksgiving in 46 and went to Alta, Utah and skied until maybe December 1st when we ran out of goat meat and frozen mackerel. <laughs> Ward had shot some goats on Catalina and we put those in the sleeping bags to get up to the snow. <laughs> they were wrapped in paper. Don't. <laughs> it was called wax paper in those days. Today it's plastic. And anyway, we spent two and a half weeks at Alta and we were really hooked. We went back to LA and spent three or four days for Christmas, hoping we would get some presents, which we didn't. Got back in the car and wound up back at Alta and then went to Sun Valley because we, had, we met some girls at Alta and they told us we should go to Sun Valley because they have a hot water swimming pool. Now, if you're living in the park parking lot at Alta, Utah, and every night it's snowing 11 inches, a hot water swimming pool is pretty attractive. <laughs> so soon after we met these three or four girls, we got into the car and towed the trailer to Sun Valley and went, parked way back in the corner of the parking lot where the post office, near where the post office is today. And one day led to another and the first few days we climbed the lift, climbed up the run with seal skins on and then we found out that, that the lift operators really like to drink beer. So on the, when we got to the bottom of the hill, the third day, went to the car and got two six packs of beer and gave them each to a lift operator. The next day, we just got on the lift and didn't have to climb up the lower toe. <laughs> and we made sure that we took care of those operators throughout the winter. But we managed to ski every day from when we got there, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> until, until we left when the lift shuts down in the spring. But you, how many of you folks have been to Sun Valley? Raise your hands. Okay. You know about the hot water swimming pools and that sort of stuff. And all you have to do is walk into the locker room like you have a key to a room and make sure that all, this, all your valuables are left in your trailer so nobody will steal them and put on your suit and go swimming in the hot water pool. What's not to like about that? And we had such a great time that winter. We went back for the second episode the following year. The, first, the second year was a lot easier deal because I got the idea to paint cartoons on the skier chalet dining room walls. And Pappy Rogers, who was a brilliant resort manager, said, well, I have to ask, I went to him with the idea and he said, I'll have to ask, ask Max Barsas first because he's been here longer than you. Of course, Max said, I'll paint him. And Pappy was such a nice guy, he said, Warren, here's the deal. Why don't you paint your cartoons on the employee cafeteria wall instead and I'll give you a season pass and you can eat cafeteria meals as long as it takes you to paint the murals. <laughs> I finished those murals about a week after the lift shut down. <laughs> it was a great winter and I skied every day, I raced quite a bit, had a good time, won a few races, lost a lot of them. And the next year I taught skiing at Sun Valley, which leads into another question that I know Neil is going to ask me. <laughs> he knows my material. You dedicate one of your books to the creator of the oyster cracker. Well, the reason for that, when Ward and I lived in the, in the parking lot, they used to put oyster crackers in big soup bowls in the roundhouse restaurant and cafeteria. And so we would show up with a plastic cup, the same kind that they've served you tea with, and go to the cafeteria line and say, can I have some more hot water for my tea bag? We had our own tea bag in our pocket, of course. 
But then we mixed the hot water, ketchup, and the oyster crackers, and we had a great tomato soup. <laughs> and we could make it as thick as we wanted to. And so that, that took care of us for lunch. And for dinner, we went to Shoshone occasionally and shot a few rabbits. Ward had a, a bent, it's called, a, when it's a really an old gun, it's called a bent barrel gun. And his was bent, but it was an over and under 4, 10, and 22, which is a great gun for rabbits because you get a shotgun hit or shotgun shot at them. If you miss them, you whistle really loud and they'll be dumb enough to stop. And then you can hit them with a 22. <laughs> so Ward was good enough. We, went, we need 10 rabbits, he'd use 10 shells. And then we would skin them and put them in the deep freeze under our trailer, not in the trailer. <laughs> but when we, when we first got there, we thought, well, like Alta, you know, we're only gonna be around here four or five days. And about 10 days or two weeks later, somebody came knocking on the trailer door and it was a local police. They said, you have to move your trailer because we have to plow out the parking lot. And by then, very rare in Sun Valley, there was about three and a half feet of snow in the parking lot and around our trailer. Well, since we, had planned on only staying a few days, we had been burying our garbage in the snowbank behind the trailer. You know, you just shove it down, and the next day you shove it down over here. And so when the rotary snowplow came through, <laughs> right, <laughs> the, from then on, when people said, where do you live? I would say, out by the milk cartons in the cottonwood tree. <laughs> and paper napkins, milk cartons and things, wrap, a couple of rabbit furs were hanging in the tree the rest of the winter. And all put together, I can't imagine having any more fun than the freedom of those two winters because there was absolutely no responsibility. We had our lift tickets wired and one, one morning, Pappy Rogers came out, knocked on the, our trailer door. This is how great a manager this man was. Knocked on the door and we looked, I looked out the open door and there was Pappy with two cups of hot coffee. And I said, well, I don't drink coffee, but Ward will drink them both. And he said, well, I noticed that we have a lot of powder snow today, so you guys better get up and get up there. And he knew what was going on. He was just an all-time great person. And most of his employees had come from Omaha, Nebraska, because that's where they built the first in the world chairlift. It was built in a railroad yard. In, in, how, many knows, how many of you know the story of that first chairlift? Two people, so I'll tell it. When, when uh, Harriman decided to build a resort, the first destination resort in America, he had one criteria. It had to be on a Union Pacific Railroad right away somewhere. And he hired a guy named Von Gottschalk to look for it. And he had met Von Gottschalk at the Post Hotel in St. Anton. And Averill was smart enough to see the German war coming and knew that there was a ready market in America for a destination ski resort. So while Von Gottschalk was looking for this, now remember, he was looking in 1935, he added two more criteria to the selection of a place for a ski resort. He added, has to be on the Union Pacific right away, but also the sleeping accommodation should not be above 6,000 feet because of potential pulmonary and cardiac problems. 1935. And secondly, we cannot build the resort close to a major city because of potential weekend crowding. You ever stood in the lift line at Snoqualmie on Saturday afternoon? <laughs> and let, let, I'm going to di divert once again for a Go moment. For the, the, the weekend crowding thing, think about this. When, when they did not develop Baldy at Sun Valley until 1940 or 41 because nobody could ski well enough to ski on that mountain. It's too steep. So when they, when they put the lifts up Baldy, single chair, 426 people per hour could get to the top of Baldy. Today they have three quad chairlifts taking 1,800 people an hour to the top. If you any good with numbers, which I'm not, 1,800 times three, that many thousands of people can get to the top of Baldy every hour. What kind of snow do you think you're gonna have? Right. Anyway, what you folks are all letter writing, card carrying, green people like I am. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna get up on a on a pet not a pedestal, but a, a stool for a moment and say, look at 
Here's what's happening. A good day at Vail now on a Saturday, 25,000 people. A good day at Crystal, I don't have any idea about the, how many people are at these resorts. Crystal, White Pass, Snoqualmie Pass, Alpenthal, Stevens and Mount Baker, that's seven resorts. There's probably, conserve, let's be conservative, say 20,000 people are there every weekend, every Saturday and Sunday. And all those people in their heart of hearts would someday like to go to Sun Valley. Well, that's occurring in every city in the West. But the Sun Valleys and the Vales and those things, they can't get any more land to put ski resort, ski lifts on, unless you folks write letters to get them. Now, I'm off of the... Should we come back around a little bit? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, let's go back. We talked about Ward, right. first couple of winters up at Sun Valley, and then you got a little help from the then president of uh, Bell and Howell right. Camera Company who kind of got you started on, right. your, on your filmmaking career. Well, I was teaching at Sun Valley, and I had two people in my class, and one of them was so far out of shape I couldn't believe it. He'd go home every day during the lunch hour and sit in a hot bath until he could stagger back for the afternoon. Because in those days, the Auto Lang would not let you take anybody on a chairlift until you had mastered a snowplow turn. And you had, they made you, we had to make them climb to do this. So anyway, midway through the week, I went to dinner with these two gentlemen, Chuck Percy and Hal Janine. They were both from Chicago. Chuck's wife had just died, and Hal brought him out there to kind of get over things. And so we went to dinner and watched a, a, a really terrible movie. And it was really bad. And anyway, we started talking about it. And Chuck said, well, it sounds like you know something about it. And uh, I said, he said, are you going to teach skiing all your life? And I said, no, here's what I want to do. I want to get in the travel lecture business. And this is 1940, early 1949. And in those days, the travel lecture business was really a big business. There was probably 200 guys traveling America on a lecture circuit because they didn't have color television. And these gentlemen would go, this year they'd go to Australia, make a movie, show it. Then next year they'd go to Norway, come back, make a movie, and show it in auditoriums of this approximate size. And I said, I want to do that, but I want to make them about skiing because nobody's doing that. And then I saw a John Jay movie. He came to Sun Valley, and I thought, wow, this guy's doing it, and he's making a living. Didn't realize he had a lot of money to start. But <laughs> He was, doing, he was doing a fabulous job. He was really funny. He was right there on the cutting edge of, of ski photography. And so I told Chuck and Hal that I want to do this. And the next day, I, I had my 8 millimeter camera with me because it was a 4-inch powder day deep for Dollar Mountain. And I was taking some pictures with it. And on the lunch, they said, well, why don't you get a 16 millimeter camera if you want to go in the travel lecture business? And I said, well, you know, I, I would really like to. But the camera I want to buy is a Bell & Howell 70 DA with a wide angle, a normal, and a two inch telephoto. And it costs $256. And I'm making $100 a month. And I don't think I'll have enough money in the spring to buy it. So the following day at lunch, Hal Janine, who was the controller of Bell & Howell, said, Warren, Chuck and I at dinner last night made the decision we are going to loan you a camera. You can pay us out of your earnings when you earn enough money to do it. So about a month later, this camera came. It was in a shiny leather box with red velvet lining. And I virtually slept with that thing the rest of my life. <laughs> it, was, it was my ticket, if you will, to almost anywhere in the world. And if you have, if you have a camp today, you can't do that with a simple, well, you can do it with a simple wind-up camera. But there's only two or three labs left in, the, in America that will process film. Everything else is electronic. And I can't even change a light bulb, as my wife will tell you. So I know nothing about electricity. So this, this was a camera that was designed as, a, as an action camera for Army, Navy, and Marine photographers during World War II. And it worked for me for, I probably made my first 20 annual films with that wind-up camera. And I finally bought an Aeroflex with electricity. And anyway, the first 14 years with my Bell & Howell, the first, I hired a cameraman in 1964, 63. 
Until then, I'd done all the photography, all the editing, stole all the phonograph records out of discount record. Rec you know, you know those, those, they used to have record stores, and there was always a $1 bin. Nobody would ever buy those records. Well, I figured I could buy those, transfer those to a tape recording, and nobody ever heard of that people, and nobody would ever sue me. So I, <laughs> and, and it worked. I, I, never, I never put the music on the film. And, and, what, and I played it as a tape recording for the background music as I sat over in the corner narrating the live film. And if you think about, think, you know, let's get on numbers for just a moment. I used to have an average audience about the size of this this evening, 500 people. And so to show my film to 50,000 people, I would have to travel to 50 cities. Now that's 50 motels, 50 bus, airplane, or rental car rides, and 100 nights to show to 50,000 people at 500 people a night. Today, I can go out and take a movie with my telephone, which I don't know how to do anything but phone the numbers in it, and I could take a movie with that, and with a single stroke, I can send that to 50,000 people. That's how much time has gotten condensed and how much, um, I don't even know what I'm saying, but it's just a, <laughs> it's a whole different world for you young people. What, what is going to be the next time condensation step? Do you well, know? I don't know. Uh, and if I did, I'd be doing something other than what I do now. But and it, what do you do now? <laughs> what do I do now? I write and I just started a job at Amazon. Good. Um, but uh, let's talk about filmmaking because you're right. Anybody can make a film now. Um, back when you started, not anybody could be a filmmaker. Well, I think they could. They could do it with 8 millimeter, <clears throat> which I did for a long time. I did for 46, 7, 8. It was the fall of 1949 when I got to Squaw Valley was when I first started operating my camera to take ski movies. But th that summer, I, had, I made a 10-minute surfing movie. And I, I put in that first winter at Squaw Valley. Uh, Squaw Valley is what it was. It had one chairlift and two rope toes. And I, I don't know the right term to put on the owner, but Let's just leave it that he was unique. And he was an attorney. Yeah, he was. <laughs> anyway, he, he bought Squaw Valley. He bought 25 acres at the bottom of the mountain. And I taught there for a guy named Emil L.A., which not very many of you people ever heard of. But he was two times world champion before World War II. And he was a, a brilliant, great guy. And so. I tried to save as much money as I could out of my $100 a month paycheck and buy a film at $11 a roll. And any time there was powder snow and everybody in the ski school, all four of us, on a good day, we'd all have a pupil. On a good day for me, there'd only be two people wanting to take lessons, and I'd put them in the movie and pretend I was taking pictures of them, but I was really getting the ski instructor. And by spring, I had shot 37 rolls of film, 400 bucks. And a, f a, a then friend of mine, unfortunately, he's passed away. He was the, he was the I think he was the editor of the West, Western, Far Western Ski or something. And he, I showed him the movies, and he said, why don't you glue these together, and I'll try to get you some ski clubs to put your movie on. And I said, that sounds like a good idea. So I spent all that summer. Uh, gluing the film together and got a sponsor. And when I, when I got the film edited, I had to get the print and buy a projector. And the print and projector were $400. By then, I was a laborer, pounding nails, making a buck an hour, and I couldn't borrow $100 from anybody. I mean $400. So I got four guys to each loan me 100 I got the print, got the projector, and then I finally got a screen, and I started going around Southern California showing my first ski film to potential sponsors, usually the officers of a ski club. And seven of the first eight people that I showed it to had the same comment. Warren, we like the photography. The music is passable. If you get somebody else to narrate it, we'll book it. <laughs> 
And I didn't, couldn't, number one, I couldn't afford somebody else to narrate it. I didn't know how to hire them. I didn't know what to pay them. And so I struggled on and narrated, you know, literally hundreds of movies. That's how that whole thing got started. And one year led to the next, to the next, to the next. And, and I followed that same kind of thing until I hired Don Berlin. And Don came to me in 1963. Up until then, I had done, as I said, everything. Filming, editing, music, book, I did all the booking, everything creative, I, I designed the posters. It was a labor of, I, 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 don't, I can't put a term on it other than intense love. And that's really what it was. I wanted to share, what I wanted to do was share those first lift rides in the morning when there isn't a track in the snow and it has just dropped 17 and a half inches of goofer feathers just for you. Everybody here knows that feeling. You know, you're all twitchy, and you finally get off, and you step out of your ski, and somebody's changed the bindings, <laughs> which has happened. But to, to share those moments, I have been, if you will, the most fortunate person in the world to have been able to grab those moments and do something with them with sometimes a well-chosen word, sometimes absolutely the wrong thing, uh, but, but to take people who have never had those kind of experiences and say, wow, if that 200 pound overweight guy can ski down the hill, maybe I can do that too. And when I, when I show somebody falling off of a chairlift, which some of you people might remember, <laughs> what happens in comedy, humor is man's inhumanity to man. If you see somebody falling off of the chairlift, you really feel good because you know that you're smart enough to do exactly the same thing when you get in the same place. You know that you're not that dumb, therefore you feel good. So it's, it, if you know that little kind of thing, man's inhumanity to man, that's, that's the basis really of all humor, whether it's George Slaughter with, when he invented Laugh-In or Charlie Chaplin when he falls on his face, when you watch those, you know that you're not dumb enough to fall on your face like Charlie Chaplin did. Well, I think one thing people really have loved about your films is, is the humor, but, but the humanity of it, too. You're not, you're not just showing the most extreme things that people are doing on the mountain. You're showing that, too, and some of those are spectacular, but, but you're showing skiing warts and all. You're showing, showing no. the, the breadth of skiing, the, the, the resorts, the people, the falling off the chair. Exactly. Well, you have to remember that when I started, Anybody that could do a half a dozen turns without falling down was an extreme skier. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is best demonstrated. I rode up in the gondola at Vale one day from Lion's Head. There was a woman in the, the gondola with me. She was 82 years old. Beautiful, snow white hair. Her grandchildren had given her a learn to ski week for her birthday, 82. And she was so excited. This was her third day. And she was going to go in ski school at the top of the mountain where it's really flat. And so I thought, well, I'm going to follow this lady. And when she got off of the chairlift, she got in her skis. And as she traversed over to the ski school meeting place, the powder snow was clear up over her edges. And when she started down that hill in a snowplow turn, she was an extreme skier <laughs> in her mind. And that's, and in my opinion, that's all that really matters. If you're exceeding what you think you can do and get away with it, you are an extreme skier. <laughs>